Life passes with us all a day at a time. So it passed with our friend Tom. Till two years were gone through parted from his from all his soul held dear. And though often yearning for what lay beyond, still was he never positively and consciously miserable. Welcome back to Book Wave. I'm your host, Scott, joined today by Pat. Hey, yeah. And Jason. Hey there. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Today we're looking at a classic known as Uncle Tom's Cabin. I guess we'll just uh, jump right into it. If you're, if you're new around here, you can check us out at uh, bookwave.club, our website, YouTube, Anchor. Most podcasting platforms, we have a donation box if you're interested. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, clearly a, a book about slavery, is we have two characters near the start of the book named Eliza and Tom, who are forced in the same situation, but choose two very different outcomes. So whoever wants to answer this question first, which one... Which path would you take if you were to be sold into slavery? The path of Eliza, the the one who takes the the the, the fight for freedom and goes for Canada, or Uncle Tom, the man who accepts his fate and goes into his new owner's house and accepts his fate. So the more I read this and learning more about the two characters, the more I think about um, two different stories that happened in the past with uncle Tom, he's more like, he's more like Jesus Christ who manifests supreme virtue and goodness. And he's one of the very few slaves who just learns to accept the fact that he is going to die. But he still has the word of God on his side and he lets that he allows that for him to grow as a human being. And he's not someone who's willing to stand out among the other characters and the other people. He's just somebody who knows for a fact that he is made it in God's image and he is willing to accept that. Whereas Eliza is more of like Viktor Frankl in a way who if you don't know Viktor Frankl was a uh, psychologist and he was a Holocaust survivor and he did everything he could to stay alive by uh, just by spreading the word of meaning and imagining a future where you are in the world of accomplishment. And so the more you think about that every single day, the more likely you are able to get out of that undeniable hell that you're in. And Eliza's kind of like that in a way. Um, maybe not on the same level as what Viktor Frankl may have gone through, but nonetheless, it gives that sort of, um, uh, what would you call it? Um, intellectually in-depth look of what it means to survive and keeping your own outcome on life above everything else. I saw both Eliza and Tom as heroes in this book um, where, like you said, Pat, Eliza was kind of um, fighting in a way. Uh, and Tom, Tom was the, t the stereotypical uncle Tom where he it was a dutiful, uh, long suffering servant, faithful, faith, faithful to his white masters. Um, if I was placed in the position of either of these two, I think I would probably run like Eliza. Um, but at the same time, a part of me would 
adopt more of an anti-hero stance if i was taking thomas position i i I would like the anti-hero in me would go and collect some bullets and get some metal and uh show these masters you know that i'm i'm gonna go out on my own terms so you're almost taking like the secret third option of eliza's husband george who he kind of takes off before he's put in the situation of, you know, between benevolent master and sold to the chaos of the great unknown to, to the deep South or wherever you don't know where you're going. If you follow this, this new owner, but you know, you have a chance at freedom if you go for the Canadian border. And of course that's the one I choose. Cause you know, I love my country. I want to go home. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would take kind of a rebel position. Now, even up in Canada, to my understanding, uh, a lot of these slaves that made it there ended up going back to Africa. They were repatriated to Liberia, which is uh, adjacent to Sierra Leone. Um, And one of the things I found interesting while researching this topic is they would have you believe that they were sent to Africa on good terms. But from my understanding is they were sent out of the country because the, the majority, the white majority did not want to uh, live with them. They, they wanted a segregated society. And so they just mm. sent everybody back to Africa to live their own life. And they developed the country of Liberia for that purpose. Yeah, there is a, a, uh like a little bit at the end of the book where it's like from George's point of view, I think where it talks about like this country in Africa, that's like a beacon of hope for, you know, African Americans to return to. So I, I don't know if enough history about that. It could just as easily be that there was two simultaneous perspectives where, you know, the African American community wanted the same thing that the white community wanted but for two completely different reasons like they just some wanted to integrate as well like some people love the united states that didn't want to go back to africa but i'm not sure if there was ever a situation where they forced them back to africa after slavery had ended so Right. I think they were given a choice. The town in Sierra Leone was called Freetown, and Mm. they essentially adopted the same democratic uh, representative democracy that we had developed here since George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. They set that up over there in Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia. I guess this kind of uh, goes into how... Stowe, the author of this book, uh, kind of explores this idea of the idea of slavery and how evil it is. And not just because of that, but also providing certain consequences that follow and what separates good men and good masters from the bad ones. Like at the beginning, um, when we had when the question was, which path will we take? Um, there's a sort of um, exploration into the morality of the practice of living in slavery. And one of the things that, uh, that I picked up on was how uh, not just uh, the oxymoronic notion of, uh, of slavery itself, but also uh, just the power that that is within that topic it's it shows that kind of uh, I'm not sure what you would call it but um, it just shows what the best interests are in that um, like for example when um, when we see uh, I think it was Tom or no, not Tom. Um, 
Now I'm forgetting about these names. Jeez. <laughs> took us a when, while to read this book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it took us a long time to read this and just try to analyze it and everything. But um, So there was Tom and there was Harry, which was Eliza's son. And uh, they were owned by Arthur Shelby. And then they were sold to uh, Mr. Haley. I don't know if this is filling in any of the blanks for you. Yeah. Um... There was also like another character named Tom who was like a colleague of Mr. Haley, wasn't there? Yes, Tom Loker. He yeah. was a slave hunter. But anyway, but anyway, it just shows a really interesting form of morality uh, as well as how the evil of slavery incorporates with Christian values. I don't know if any of you picked up on that. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned Victor Frankl, too, and he talked a lot about like the concentration camps and like I think it was in Man's Search for Meaning where he mentioned the how the the SS would force the Jews to like just, you know, as a form of work, you know, take these bags of concrete, move them to the other side of the camp and then get the second group to take the same bags of concrete and move them back to just create completely redundant work for themselves. And Viktor Frankl talked about how like he was able to find meaning in such a thing, like which harkens back to the the myth of Sisyphus. Like even if you're just pushing a rock up a hill day in and day out like, and once you get to the top, the rock is always going to roll down to the bottom and you know this is going to happen. You know, you're either going to push the rock up the hill or you're going to lose your mind. Cause you're, you're not going to have anything to do if you just sit at the bottom of the hill with your rock. At least you're doing something when you're, when you're pushing the rock up the hill. And I think a lot of that kind of mentality comes in Uncle Tom's story here. And like a lot of the, the stoic principles that you might find, like even in that first quote that I read out, like he was never wholly miserable no matter what happened. And like I don't want to give away too much context for what happened right before that quote, but you know, he he goes through a lot in this book and it's it's hard to read. It's I I was just talking about how like before we started, I don't think this book is meant to be enjoyed but it's it's definitely important to read and to understand these perspectives there were two main themes that i noticed in this book and one were one was um showing some of the worst aspects of slavery and this is what built the abolitionist movement because they're showing how slavery splits up the family we have tom who's married he has children and he's being right. sold and he's going to leave those he's going to leave his family behind and then we have harry eliza's son who's essentially being taken away from his mother at a young age um, the other aspect is the dehumanization of people if you're a slave you are essentially property and uh, we see this where we have arthur shelby he's in a position of debt and when he's a Kentucky farmer, when you are a farmer and you're in debt, you sell some of your property to make that money back. And in the time that this was written, Tom was considered property. So he was just selling property. Uh, same with Harry, he was uh, being sold. The other main theme that I saw was that the author was trying to show that Christian love can transcend and possibly fix these uh, these problems and aspects of slavery that it will um, like the the love that we saw between the fraternal love that we saw between Tom and Eva St. Clair where right. she saw him as a person not as just property yeah, or, she you know. she saw him as a friend. 
she like there's one part in the book where she's pleading to her father like I want you to free all of my friends she doesn't even consider using the word slave at all like it's it's not part of her opinion of these people like they're not servants they're her friends yeah and same goes with how miss ophelia teaches topsy how to read right and understand words and not just that but understand the emotion behind the words yeah um, and it's only because of you know the lesson that ava teaches ophelia in the end that she's able to show that christian love to topsy so like it's hurt people hurt people but you know loved people can also love people maybe that's the other end of it right um there was a contradiction um and some irony that i saw in the author's perspective that uh christian love can transcend slavery and that is that i saw it as it is from the christian canon that essentially legitimizes slavery so back in genesis we have the old testament where god is telling people to be fruitful and to multiply to replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over over every living thing on earth. And people have taken this to... Yeah, the Bible to, also says your slaves shall come from the countries around you. So that's a hard one to get around to. But I think it's hard to compare, you know, where we are 2,000 years later or 1,800 years later, 6,000 years later, whatever it was, to, like, like how long ago that was. Like, I don't... I don't think the Bible was ever making an excuse for slavery. It was just trying to, you know, tell the people that existed at the time how the world was because there just wasn't a conceptualization of not having slaves. But clearly at the time where this book was written, the conceptualization of liberty and freedom was on the rise just not for the people from the other countries who we've taken to be as servants yeah it was incomplete at the time right precisely i mean back in the time of the hammurabi code there were codifications for how to have slaves how to treat them where you can get slaves from yeah. and then hundreds or a thousand years later we have these ideas of uh where the the american colonies um fought a revolutionary war to free themselves from the britain um, monarchy and at the same time these were protestant people so they were fighting against the catholic uh doctrine and church that essentially said the pope had dominion over the entire world the bible was written in latin and you had to go through the the church to understand it and people didn't have the the bible to read this was like you know 1300 80 um but this idea of having dominion over every living thing gets adopted into the discovery doctrine where the pope says you know we're going to go out on these crusades and spread the word of christianity and it's also part of the manifest destiny where when the americans first came to this country they wanted to they wanted to develop it in the name and under the banner of christianity they saw it as a mandate from their god to make this country flourish and it was just part of life up until then that uh, you could have slaves you could have servants that would help you in that in that goal so they didn't necessarily see it as 
wrong. They just saw it as a aspect of the conquest. And it wasn't Mm -hmm. until the abolition movement, right around when this book was coming out in 1852, around the 1820s up until 1852, the abolition movement was growing. And uh, there was this idea that we shouldn't, that it's amoral to keep slaves and it's certainly amoral to treat them uh, the way they were being treated. Mm-hmm. And you can go back to like the Hammurabi's code thing too and like see how it, it might have split into two different kinds of things like the like two different forms of caste systems like into like the kind of system they have in India and or historically have had in India and how it's progressed and changed and you could see how it's done the same thing in the western world with slavery so I I think like uh, there's elements of each of these things that are just unavoidable like there's always going to be a form of hierarchy with You know, some people are going to get left at the bottom and some people are going to rise to the top and that's going to be inevitable. But the main thing we have to to focus on is we can't like build that into the system. Like we can't make it systematic that those people who, you know, fall through the cracks and reach the bottom, we can't make it so we systematically keep them there and just assign them the role as the role of property because that that's just that goes against everything we believe in atheist or christian i think we can all agree on you know people deserve sovereignty and liberty and you know the rights to do what we want with our lives and not be beholden to others and this goes back to the idea of what the system of slavery is in the book because Later on, um, I think this is right after, um, I think it was during Tom's trials after St. Clair's death, um, is when we finally get to see the ugly parts of not just the slave owners, but the slaves themselves, and how the system, the entire system of slavery, ends up losing what is right and wrong and the latter of that effect extends even further like we see how some of the slaves uh turn against each other and make and make them more crueler and how the plantation uh lacks a sense of of religion in a way or meaning whichever one it is and It is at at that point on where we see a massive transformation in this part, especially with Tom as as a martyr and saying that he would rather face a severe beating rather than just um, another another way around it, like a I guess a shortcut or to avoid a, t- a particular punishment and just accept yeah. his fate. And everything. He also realizes like those kind of choices have consequences. Like back to the start of the book too, when he accepts his fate and decides, no, I'm going to go to my new owner. That's, that's the fate my current owner has decided for me. He needs me to do this for him because he needs the money. Plus if I just run for the border myself with Eliza and her kid, you know, I'm just going to be replaced by someone else. Someone else on this farm who I really care about is going to go in my place. And, you know, it's it's better I go than, like, my wife or my buddy here, whatever. Like, he, he makes that sacrifice consistently throughout the novel. Yeah, I think if he had run or adopted an anti-hero position, things would have been much worse for his family his mm-hmm. wife and kid they wouldn't have uh they probably would have been sold 
they would have been separated regardless. So yeah, he took up the mantle and he took on the burden and just uh, allowed himself to be sold. And ultimately, um, although I saw elements of a tragedy in this story, things do turn out good in the end for not for Tom per se, but for some of the people he helped. Mm -hmm. So when he was being, um, after he was sold to Simon Legree, this cruel master, which shows how degrading people can be to these, uh, these black people. He was not, he was refusing to give them the information he, they wanted because he was protecting Casey and uh, Emmeline. And he knew right, if he yeah. told them where those two sex slaves were, that uh, that would be um, unethical. That would be amoral. So it, the, the best thing he could do was take on the burden, ultimately death, in almost a, a Christ-like um, fashion to keep the whereabouts of those two um, secret. And uh, not to, uh, well, I guess it is giving it away, but in the end, Casey ends up being related to mm -hmm. our um, introductory character, Eliza. Yeah, the, it all comes in full circle and they make a good or the author does a good job of getting the point across that this is all because of the sacrifice of Uncle Tom. And it also is kind of like, not directly, but it's kind of accusatory. It's like, do we, was this really necessary? Like, you, you've seen this story. Did we need to sacrifice Tom? Is in almost the same way to say, like, you've, you've seen the, the story of Jesus Christ. Do you think that was just? Do you, do you think that was right? Like, come on, like, these martyrs are important for this reason. Like, it makes every, it gives everyone the perspective of saying, okay, even in the contrast of the benevolent slave owners and the tyrannical ones, it doesn't make a difference because, you know, if a benevolent slave owner just gets hit by a car one day, the family's going to need to make that money up. It's going to sell a couple more slaves to some bad families. And, you know, the cycle of hatred and fear continues. Like, no no good can come of it. And, like, freeing the slaves is really the only answer. Like, a world with slavery is just unethical no matter what way you slice it. Yeah, it, it took the country a long time to get to that point because when this book came out, uh, it was, I, I believe, originally posted as a serial novel in a publication called The National Era, which was an abolitionist newspaper. And after the author realized how popular it was, she expanded on it and turned it into a book. But the abolitionist movement was already growing strong before this. And with this book, it really catalyzed things. Um, Abraham Lincoln was uh, president back in this time. And I believe he attributed this book as being one of the aspects that led up to the Civil War. This, mm. this was like a very controversial book when it came out because it, for exactly the points we're talking about, it's stating that this whole system is, is built on an amoral foundation. Even though if you look at some of the biblical text, you could use those as justification for the, the way the system has been implemented. Uh, but one thing I found interesting while researching the topic of slavery is in something you mentioned earlier, Scott, the caste system. Right. It's yeah. really only in societies that have a caste system 
there's a correlation between that and the level of uh, servitude and slavery. So for the vast majority of our human history, we've had hierarchies and there's nothing inherently wrong with having a chief um, yeah. uh, or a hierarchy. But it wasn't until the agricultural revolution where we started to see stratification of caste and society that allowed us to. Yeah, well, that to, would have been the point in history where we were able to sustain enough people in a certain society. Like once we start planting food in the ground, we don't have to rely on like hunting animals or being a nomadic peoples as much anymore. We just stay put, organize our society in one spot with a large number of people. And that large number number of people are going to have children. And populations are only going to grow from there. So you're going to need to figure out a way to organize them. And, you know, different societies all over the world have come up with different ways to do that. Right. So back in the time of Hammurabi, the Egyptians, where we have a, a smaller group of top cast members that mm -hmm. need support that we we get this um system of, of servitude and slavery and like i was mentioning earlier that when the crusades happened they used this idea of the discovery doctrine to say any land we discover is considered new and any inhabitants are they're going to be uh, pulled under our banner of spreading the word of God. Because, I mean, ultimately, the Crusades, they were trying to get to Asia. They didn't know America was there. So they were trying to circumnavigate around Africa to get to the east side of Asia so that they could come yeah. up on the backside of the Muslims. Yeah, they wanted, they wanted to find India. That's precisely why when Columbus landed, he was like, hey, look at all these Indians, and then it kind of stuck. <laughs> so what did you think of the finale of this? Uh, which finale are you referring to? Like the, the after bit where it's like uh, George talking about like his publications and stuff or just the the finale of Tom with his young master from the beginning. Well, both actually. <laughs> Maybe we should walk through the plot a little more um, before we get to the finale. Uh, hmm. Like, so Tom sold and Harry and Eliza escape and they're being hunted by uh, Tom Loker, which has been contracted by Mr. Haley. Yeah. And there was a, uh, aspect of a redemption story that I saw here with the, the slave hunter Tom Loker so he he catches up with Eliza and Harry and then then he gets shot I believe by George yeah I think you're right I don't remember that part super well but that sounds about right the aspect of redemption came comes in later where when Tom is being killed and Casey and Emmeline are escaping that uh, Tom comes in and helps those two ladies escape. Uh, so he's changed from a slave hunter to basically um, a helper. He's helping them escape. Yeah, it's like you find these little victories in a story like this and it makes you feel good. But like at the same time, it it gives you these moments where it's like it doesn't make a difference as long as the law is the way it is. And I think that's the point that they were trying to make with the Tom Locker story. It, yeah, this guy realized that what he was doing is horrible could be called a sin could be called evil could be called whatever you want and he decides to change but at the end of the day that's just an individual and you know 
everyone is still going to expect him to do the same job that he's been doing for how many years, you know, catch the escaped slaves, their property that's running away. And once he realizes the error of his ways, it's like, oh yeah, that's just a drop in the bucket. There's still a lot of work to do here. But this book brings up a, a dangerous idea for the country at its time, that the idea of uh, the absolution of slavery. I mean, it led or was one of the factors that led to the Civil War, where we have people fighting over this very idea that the states, should they be allowed to have the rights to, to legislate slavery? in their own jurisdictions or should it be permitted that the federal government outlaw and abolish it completely and i don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people died over this very idea yeah like we we had this discussion on one of our wave casts about like the you know legalization of cannabis just as an example like when it comes down to just states' rights, should the federal government have this much power? Where, like, in, like, most normal situations, I would say, yeah, probably the state should have more say in what, you know, the state does. But when it comes to something as disgusting and evil as slavery, yeah, like, Abraham Lincoln needed to step in. There was just no other way around it. Like if if you if you're going to fight a war to free yourselves from British rule, then like this is definitely a a, a war worth fighting to. Which is like not not too many countries go to war about slavery. Like that says a lot about the the south but it also says a lot about how seriously the abolition movement took their goals like they weren't going to rest until they had achieved freedom for everyone and uh you know if if war is the only answer then i guess they were past talking at that point but from my understanding it was like the only reason the few states were allowed to keep their their laws for slavery was because they needed their backing in like the American Revolution or else they wouldn't have been able to defeat the British so there's there's yeah. also like a yeah there's like a catch 22 there where are you going to yeah. say that <laughs> Well, I was I was actually going to say that. I mean, there's some good things and bad things about it that can be uh, beneficial, like I said before. But um, I think it all comes down to um, just control, you know, power. Um, and mm -hmm. it's just like, I mean, it's just like the idea of drinking alcohol. I mean, it's it can be good for some for some to some extent but if you drink too much of it then who knows where you will spiral to and if you have a lot of power um, you have to be moderately responsible for it and not just use it out on a whim however you please and this kind of goes into uh, you know what we've been mentioning here so yeah, and we, if we're going to have a conversation about power, who else to bring up but Friedrich Nietzsche and his will to power? And, you know, he'd, he'd have something to say about, you know, the morality and the, the religion of the people in this novel. Like, because when we were talking about um, Beyond Good and Evil, he was talking about everything coming down to the will to power. He described Christianity as a slave morality. So in a way, uh, you could describe the slave owners as having a similar morality in the way that like they don't have 
as much agency as they could. They could speak up, but they don't. Like, for example, the character of Ophelia, who preaches and preaches and preaches the whole book through about how abolition is going to be necessary. And, you know, she owns slaves herself. So it doesn't really... Like, if you're not talking the talk... Or if you're not walking the walk, it's useless to talk the talk. Like, you're you're not doing anything. Your your morality is still pretty slavish. If you if you don't have the power to make a difference, so like not to accuse Christianity itself of anything of the sort, but some of these you know characters that come off as like benevolent people who understand what needs to happen they're also kind of like the villains in atlas shrugged who don't really do anything for themselves right but then you have the people like the quakers where they were doing everything they could because of their religion so that would that would be the rebuttal against nietzsche because the Quakers were the ones that took in Eliza and George for the longest time and helped them get to the Canadian border. And they did all of it because of their religion. So, like, they that's a good example of people during this time that, you know, unapologetically breaking unjust laws to do as much as they possibly can, but they're not exactly fighting the... St- the systemic part of it. Like there's a difference between breaking the law to do what's right and fighting against unjust laws as they exist. What do you think about that? Yeah. I kind of see corollaries between this idea of uh, a just master treating their slaves, um, properly and the more um common system we have today where you have employers and managers who have are tasked with overseeing their uh direct reports and uh the need to be a good just manager it it would be a a far stretch to say that employees are slaves but I know I have heard that argument before yeah. from um, certain uh, cynics that you know. Yeah, equate. that's a good word for them, cynics. <laughs> let's let's leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, they equate you know uh, working for uh, a system or a corporation with some kind of modern day slavery. Um, the the this idea that you have to treat your employees justly is still there um but there was a competing uh idea after this book came out which was written in another book called aunt, aunt phyllis's cabin and right. here and they were trying to portray the the master or the slave owner as a uh, benevolent a uh, kind, caring person who would take people into their house and give them a life that they might not otherwise be able to have. Like uh, we had a couple stereotypes drawn from this book, one of which was the Uncle Tom, which is just a dutiful, faithful servant to their master. Uh, we had the Mammy, which is like a house house nurse um, so eliza would be kind of considered a mammy and then we had the pickaninny which would be like dark-skinned children who would uh, dance and sing or run around the house um, kind of for the amusement of the masters but uh, this idea of the benevolent benevolent master i mean it's it was competing with this idea that you you can't be a benevolent master, uh, essentially what the abolitionists were espousing. 
Yeah, but, like, that's just the thing. Both stories can exist simultaneously. Like, I'm, I'm certain that there were a few families in the South during this time that treated their, like, slaves just like family, just like they would treat, like, their own children. But at the same time, like, it's just exactly what we've said before. Like, if something happens to those people then what what's to happen with the slaves like you shouldn't your entire lively sh- livelihood can't be dependent on someone else that's fallible it, yeah know. puts people in a precarious position i mean we have two situations in this book where the owners are benevolent we have the first the yeah. shelby family arthur and emily and then we have the st Clairs. but ultimately when somebody is reliant on on another entity for their ultimate well-being, you end up in like a tragedy. Yeah. And it kind of begs the question, like, is there any master to ourselves but ourself? You know, should we allow ourselves to to be subjugated by anyone but our own soul. I think that's what God's for, right? Like, is is that an well, argument that makes sense? <laughs> well, I mean, that's like you, what you mean by God. Okay, if you are, you know, well, it it, it doesn't really matter what I what I mean by God. If you have this abstraction that's in this higher realm outside of yourself and that is what you worship and what you believe in you're not going to get you know fooled by anything else like i think that's a part of uncle tom's thing too is that it doesn't matter who owns him he says over and over again like no i belong to the lord and that's all there is to it he owns my soul, not you. You may have paid for it, but he he's put his stamp on. He signed his name on my soul, and that is what I'm all about. But like I think that can also come from just yourself as an individual. I don't think you have to extrapolate it to something that you have to call God, but it is a tool that people use. All right. I think yeah, I alienated probably a large swath of people and was giving more of a humanist, uh, non-theist perspective. But yeah, if you are subjugating yourself to a god, you're essentially in a religion. But if you're doing the same thing to your uh, quote-unquote higher self, um, that is more of a humanistic position. And and so your higher self, that can be kind of like a vague term. And I like to think of it in the terms of your future self, yeah. uh, your maybe future your, self. Maybe your best self. Exactly. Yeah. Your future best potential. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. And you see, like this, this also comes into the conversation we had yesterday just about language. Like, I'm I'm a humanist, materialist-minded kind of person, too. I'm just throwing in these elements of religion just because, I, I don't know, I want to try to translate anything that gets gets lost in our absolutely humanist perspective. I don't want to just have these conversations like, oh, this guy believes in God, and that helped him out, so that's pretty cool. Wouldn't work for me, though, but, like, these are the tools he uses. These are the framework. This is the framework that got him through like everything that he faced in his life. And he was never wholly miserable. And like, that's a lot more than I can say for myself. So 
If- yeah, and I think in the position these guys are in, if you try to take the humanist position, uh, it just wouldn't work. You know, yeah. they're as they almost needed to to have this idea in uh, providence at the end that this life was just going to be transcended and that they will be welcomed into like God's loving arms after all this is over, after their suffering and burden is done without that, you know, they could easily have fallen into hopelessness. Yeah. That's, that's when I start to think about Epictetus because, you know, he was famous for being a slave 2000 years ago, little, little bit more than that, I think. But like there's a famous story that gets thrown around about Epictetus where like him being a slave and his master like twisting on his leg and Epictetus just sitting there calmly saying, don't do that. You're going to break my leg. That's that's your property that you're breaking. Why are you going to break my leg? Don't break. Look what you've done. You broke my leg. Good job. <laughs> so. It'd be hard to say that Christianity had anything to do with, you know, Epictetus's lived experience, but I definitely think that he had some kind of connection with some form of the transcendence. Which even even as an atheist, I don't think you can have a non-spiritual existence. Like as much as you try to run away from the woo and all this and all that it's like not it's 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 part of your existence there's things you can't explain magic is real it just depends on how you define it does the magic come from you or does the magic come from above that's the real question yeah i've tried the non-spiritual path and what i found is a lack of meaning Uh, down that path and so while i'm not i'm not what i would call a christian i'm not what i would call a buddhist Um, i'm somewhere in between and uh, i do have some ideas of a spiritual realm something beyond just my body um, something of greater importance and that's what injects meaning into my actions and without that, you end up kind of um, in the nihilistic trap of there is no meaning. There is no meaning to this world, so it doesn't matter what I do. And so that's one of the aspects that um, the characters in this book really portray is they're putting their faith in Christianity, whether or not they fully understand it, they they are unlikely to have been literate and have read the Bible. Um, but certainly they have been exposed to it in the church and heard uh, preachers talk. But I think that's what allows them to get through these uh, really tragic lives they were living. It's kind of what allowed them to be a hero. If you look at it from like the uh, hero's journey perspective, they were, if you look at this time in American history, you could call it hell. And so these characters are willfully trudging through that in the hopes that there's a providence waiting for them like Dante's Inferno you gotta you gotta tread through the underworld before you can make it through purgatory and then to paradise so was there anything else I'm trying to think here I feel like I did have more but I pretty much said everything that I needed to say for this one it's um it's some it's a book that you need to read at least once in your life again it's not it's not a walk in the park type of novel it's yeah, definitely not <laughs> it's just something that needs to be understood 
Yeah. And the the actual prose of the book is incredible too. Like it's there's so much drastic difference between when like each of the characters speak like you get such like you get such a decent understanding of how all of these people talk and like most of the dialogue is written out phonetically so you can actually like actually have that fly on the wall experience of like oh this is how they're pronouncing their words and when it's just like narration it's like it's it's just written really well I kind of thought it was interesting how after this book was published in the South, it was essentially illegal. And if you were caught reading it, um, you could be jailed or lynched just for having these ideas. And I also found it interesting that this book sold better in Great Britain than it did in America. And it's possibly because it was banned in certain parts of the the U.S. Yeah, that that makes sense. But I could also see, like, the contrast, though, like we were saying before we were recording, like, it, it, it makes sense that it would be more popular in a country that had already done away with slavery than in one where half the people were still fighting for slavery. And, of course, the controversial the controversy of the legality of the whole thing too it wouldn't have been as accessible right. like even even as a canadian reading this book it was like you know when you're reading a book and you try to like put yourself in the position of some of the characters like i always felt the impulse to be like yeah, i'm canadian i'm i'm the guy on the other side of the border helping all these guys you know, come to freedom. But, like, as Jordan Peterson always hammers home, too, it's not always that simple. You know, if you were in Nazi Germany, chances are you would have had some reverence for the SS. You know, it's, that's yeah. just how it works. Like, you don't, yeah. you don't choose a lot of these things. And it's important to put yourself in the position of, like, the most horrible characters in this book like imagine what it would take to have yourself be put in that position and like really analyze how you would react to that because that's the only way you can be prepared for when those decisions actually come your way in life are you gonna stand for what's right for what you believe in or are you just gonna you know go along with the flow and say oh yeah those those guys waging war all over the world that's it's just the way it is you know the caste system that's okay it's just the way it is slavery you know it's just the way it is you got to you you got to be conscious conscious about your decision making when it comes to important decisions like this as well as preserving your individuality absolutely well, I could easily see how somebody would fall into the trap of being an angry, cruel person like Simon Legree, you know, just based on the idea that people are property. If, if for example, right. somebody goes and steal, if your car runs away, you're going <laughs> to go and, and chase it down. Yeah. Uh, if you if somebody steals some of your property, you're going to do what you have to do to get it back. And if you're at the same time dealing with anger management issues and um, you're not happy with necessarily the way uh, life is, because uh, life back then was pretty tough. So I can imagine people were a little more hostile, but I could yeah. see myself in that position. And yet I would consciously, uh, from my current perspective, choose not to act like that. Yeah, and even, like going back to the, if you see them as property, even if it's property that you love and respect that's running away from you, like your dog runs away from home, you're going to go after your dog. That's that's your puppy. That's You, you want him back, obviously. And like, I, it's horrible 
to like make that kind of comparison and that's not what I'm trying to say at all but you know I feel like that might have been the same kind of like understanding that they would have had like the same thing if you if your car runs away from home if you leave your car in neutral and it just starts rolling down the hill you're going to you're going to want to do something about that if your dog runs away from home you're going to want to do something about that if your slave runs away from home and you don't see them as a human then you know how how do you go about that like that's not that's a perspective that's very difficult for me to step into but just to consider that and think about it to go backwards in history to think about these things that have been human experiences nothing is keeping them from being human experiences again in the future except for our conscious awareness of it all i i did have one question and it was why do you think this novel was so popular instead of just fading away into the histories of uh, as a serial um, story in the national era why did it grab people's attention so much hmm. well I mean, it kind of goes think... it kind of goes back to what we were saying about systems and how it can greatly influence people's minds and where that outcome leads to like there are some there were some good slaves and good slave owners and then there are some bad ones and if you let a system you know overtake you much like alcohol does to your mind then who knows where it might lead you to and it's always best to be cognizant of, of that so i think that's and especially with the idea of Christian morality that's mixed into this. And I think that's that's what the understanding of human beings is. And I think that's the reason why it became so popular. Did you guys have an easy time identifying with any of the characters? Um, off and on in pieces like sometimes it was more difficult than others like like i was just saying i try to make a conscious a conscious effort to say like you know what if i was put in this position what if i was you know forced into some of these decisions but some of it is a lot more difficult than others like like jordan peterson says it's no one likes imagining themselves standing at the gate of Auschwitz like but you know it's it, these are inevitable human experiences so I hate to repeat myself but just be yeah. cognizant of it <laughs> yeah and yeah and there was like one piece at the very end just from the author where it was like uh, saying you know, people have questioned me whether or not if this was fiction or something that really happened. And she talks about it being a blend of both. How it's like, how she said that each of these stories, I know for certain, I know absolute examples of people that have gone through this story, but I've just woven them all together here for you to you know take a look at all these examples of things that have happened so you know you can decide for yourself if this is fiction or non-fiction i'm just telling you like this is real fiction or non-fiction it's real so i would kind of I, classify it as a historical fiction yeah but like i think just that point there like fiction or non-fiction it's real that was and it's so tragic and horrible and it, perspective is more valuable than anything. So I think when people read this book back in the day, they realized that, you know, that difference between people as property and people as free agents. Like, I think when that cognitive dissonance 
actually struck in, people lost their minds and they decided that this needed to be read by other people. This These ideas needed to be explained to other people. And I think that's why it was so popular. Like The necessity of this book is more of a factor than the you know how well it was written or like the literature and the prose of the thing it's just the necessity of these ideas more than just an entertaining novel to read before going to bed i don't recommend reading this before going to bed i i yeah. do i but i do all my reading in the morning and then i was depressed for the rest of the day so <laughs> You know, it, it works. Do whatever works for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I think that's a good little spot to wrap it up. Again, if you're... Good discussion. Yeah, really. It was, it was good to finally get into this book. It's It's been a long time coming, and I I hope there's some people still still around listening. And if you are, remember we're we're on YouTube, Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcast, all that good stuff. Got our website, www.bookwave.club. We got the denote the donation box through Anchor if you're interested. And uh until next time, may the force be with you. Later. Won't you be my neighbor?